Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, JPG, D, 5, 8. Initiate part one. Hello team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome the amazing JPG. JPG is a pop culture critic, geek educator, convention speaker, Twitch streamer, and podcaster. He is one of the co-hosts of In Quest of Geek, a pop culture discussion podcast that dives deep into your favorite films, TV series, and more. He's also on several Masks actual play podcasts, playing Steel Spectre on Nerds on a Roll, The Blade of Sorrows on Moon Harbor Heroes, and The Unrivaled on In Quest of Geek's own ongoing campaign. JPG, I am so excited to welcome you to Whelmed. I have to ask, you make <laughs> that sound much cooler than when I say it out loud? Because when I say it out loud, <laughs> it just sounds dumb, right? Like it just, yeah, I'm like, oh, cool. Like in Emily's voice, that actually sounds pretty impressive. When I say it, I'm a big old nerd. Nah, man, this is, we all need, we all need other people to hype us up sometimes. I appreciate that, yes. Because you are deserving of hype. <laughs> I, I it's really funny too because I just realized how many masks podcasts I'm on too. <laughs> and just how our worlds like just intertwine at this point and you're gonna be real mad uh, because I might be on a few others pretty soon so so yeah <laughs> so if JPG is on more masks podcasts by the time this comes out we're sorry they weren't included he plays too many teen superheroes do. and that's I what we have all realized too many of them yes <laughs> So before we begin, I want to remind everyone listening that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including all three seasons of the show so far, the comics, the video game, and even the audio play. So if you have not seen, read, or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, please consider this your warning. And with all of that out of the way, let's dive in. So I touched on a few things in the intro, (laughs) just a few, but could you tell us a little more about who you are and what you do? Yeah, so uh, this all started as uh, as a way for uh, uh, two very special people in my life to get extra credit uh, through a communications class that was a radio show that turned into a podcast. So we did podcasts for a very long time, very uh, like non sequentially, I guess, and and just like kind of roughshod. And then we got really <laughs> we got really really serious about it. We opened up a whole network. I was running 10 podcasts at one time, and then basically the pandemic hit. So, <laughs> yeah. so uh, now I'm running my own stuff. I'm trying to focus a little bit more on my own brand. Um, being a both a pop culture critic and a geek educator is very, very important to me. There are two very important pieces, I think, when it comes to, I guess, absorbing pop culture in general, right? Uh, because first and foremost, yes, please feel free to enjoy things, but we should all always be a little bit critical about the things that we are enjoying, right? On the other side of it, all of this stuff, right? Comic books, video games, board games, uh, a tabletop, right? All of them have incredible teaching tools that we don't tend to focus on. And uh, in my career, I've gotten to, oh gosh, um, I've gotten to teach about like dice statistics with D&D. I've gotten to help um I've gotten to help with like reading comprehension for uh for people with English as a second language through comic books, like things like that. So there's a lot of really really great teaching tools in what we're already enjoying and experiencing in the first place. Absolutely agree on all of that. And I think I think one of the amazing things about all of that is Like criticism does not have to be negative and does not have to be hating things. You can look critically at stuff to celebrate the things that it does as well. And I think that's something people forget sometimes when they hear people say like, oh, I'm a I'm a movie critic or I'm a pop culture critic. It's like, well, sometimes that means that I'm celebrating the wonderful things that media is doing by looking at it critically and looking deeper into what this thing is saying and not just saying, oh, this is a fun movie, but going, here's why this is such a good movie. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, uh, please don't get me wrong. Um, There are certain franchises and things that I experience that I will just outright turn my brain off. And (laughs) that's okay. We all need that sometimes. That is okay to do sometimes. Yes. But it's also totally wonderful and totally fun to do what we as nerds do, which is forget how to like things casually and dive very deep into things that maybe weren't intended to be as deep as we as we treat them. Uh, I mean, like, I would I would refer to it as a gross obsession. 
<laughs> you know, like it's, it's a, um, uh, but I think that's the best thing about, um, and, and I use this term very liberally as well, but like, that's what I enjoy about our culture. You know, that um, that anybody could literally be a part of this. Anybody can enjoy it in the way that they enjoy it. But, oh, my God, all of us enjoy it. Right. And uh, and uh, I mean, you're the perfect example, right? You're you're one of the <laughs> you're one of the founders of, of this incredible show focusing on one show. Right. And like and, and all aspects of it as well. Right. We we did some math one time and we're like, we've done like several hundred hours of content about three seasons of a show that total less than a hundred hours, <laughs> far less than a hundred hours. I don't remember what the exact math is right now, but it's like, we've done, we've done a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we've done, I forget what the, ex- we did the math once when someone asked and we're like, that's a, that's a big fraction right there. <laughs> that's a big ratio. <laughs> but Yes. Loving things, diving deep into them. It's what we do here, and it's what you do on In Quest of Geek and everything else that you do across the internet. With In Quest of Geek specifically, um, you know, uh, Alex is is our showrunner for that. And um, what she has done is that, you know, we we actually do two episodes on the same exact thing, right? So there's one episode called Tavern Team, and that's going to be kind of like going over, okay, well, who are the actors? What is this all about? And try they try not to be as spoilery and things like that and and it's really used as like an intro right like how could we get you excited about this as opposed to dungeon dive all the dungeon dive ones are the ones that i speak on and that's when we go over like this social cultural emotional sort of uh uh pieces that we can pull from the series or the content that we're going to be reviewing right uh because um if you enjoy something you should you don't have to know everything about it, but like it doesn't it doesn't hurt to try and know more things about it, right? <laughs> sometimes it's just fun yes. to learn all of the lore. And then sometimes, sometimes it's yeah. fun. You don't need to. It's no gatekeeping here. You do not need to know anything about anything to enjoy the thing, and that is valid. Yes. But sometimes you're like, okay, but what if I just dive far too deep into the vault of all of the knowledge about this fictional thing uh, and fill my brain <laughs> with things that are seemingly useless, but very fun to know. And, uh, you know, I um, I would hate to like mess with your release dates for the show, but like something we were talking about off air is the Shadow and Bone series and like how I'm so freaking obsessed with it right now. <laughs> and you're the first uh, person I've gotten to talk to about this. We can we can talk. All about this at some point <laughs> off, off, off recording, just because if we, my fr- my friend who just started watching this show uh, after I was like, hey, you should watch the show, uh, has had to deal with me texting her and just being like, I have fallen into the rabbit hole that is these books. Anyone who has looked at my Twitter in the past couple of weeks is like, oh, Emily read a 500 page fantasy novel in three days because that's just who she is sometimes because... <laughs> This show was like, here's a ragtag group of criminal teenagers who pull off giant heists and all have very specific skills. And I went, that's my jam and I will read it all immediately. And, and what's really <laughs> funny, too, is that like this kind of bleeds into like what I um, like what you asked me to come on for today, too, which is I know that we're going to be talking about archetypes today. Yes, and we will get into there are it. so excited. many archetypes in Shadow and Bone that like I was like, hey, did you guys read my diary? <laughs> like, is this, because this is eerily creepy that everything is perfect for me on this yeah. one, you know? I like, hear you. There's, a, there's a young woman who, who finds out that she's more powerful than she actually is, like a big old softy, handsome dude who was a, who had to be protected by her, but then also is a complete awesome fighter in all this other stuff when he grows up. There are people f- pulling heists. There's all this magic avatar stuff. I'm so excited for it right now. And I, this is going to be the last thing I say about this because this will turn <laughs> into a Six of Crows podcast by accident. People, anyone in my real life has understood that I have been s- shouting about the Bee Birds Do Crime show for weeks now. <laughs> uh, but I totally agree. And I think part of what is very fun was like that, see, those books. All of this might get cut and end up in a blooper reel, but uh, those books were always kind of pitched to me and I think marketed the Six of Crow books 
which are the ones I have read because I I read everything out of order and backwards, apparently, uh, instead of starting with the original trilogy. It was always like, oh, it's this dark fantasy with the d- d- outlaws coming together to pull off an impossible heist and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, that doesn't really sound like my jam. And then after watching the show and being like, well, this is very much my jam, reading the books, I'm like, oh, this is the Breakfast Club pulls off a fantasy heist. Why didn't anyone tell me that was what this book was? Because that's what this book is. And I love that. Like, where was the marketing team, right? Like, did they just, like, phone it in on this one? or? But I, I get it. The, the tagline of the books is, like, six dangerous hero- six dangerous outlaws, one impossible heist. And I'm like, that is literally what happens. And I get that there is a lot of dark stuff in this two-book series. But there's also repeated conversations that are just teenagers being teenagers and being disasters and pretending that none of them are in love with each other while they do crime and i'm like why did no one tell me that was what these books were (laughs) why did no why did no one in 2015 when these came out and everyone was shouting about them why did no one pull me aside and go no you know how you love that teen superhero nonsense it's like that but fantasy and i'd be like what tell tell me this tell me this please yeah there should have been somebody who just gifted me these books at this point i'm very mad but we will talk about (laughs) <laughs> me and J- me and JPG are going to run off and just talk about Shadow and Bone We're, some other time. I mean, honestly, <laughs> this this whole podcast is just starting off to, like, is this our Shadow and Bone podcast now? Like, is this just, is this what we're starting? <laughs> is this another project that I'm going to be on to talk about oh, teen God. stuff as a mid-30s man? <laughs> oh, God. It's chaos. Podcasting is chaos and... We don't know how to like things casually. Nope. <laughs> but speaking of teen superheroes, that thing this podcast is supposed to be about. <laughs> so, JPG, when did you first see Young Justice? Did you watch watch it on DVD, watch it on Netflix, catch the original run, or were you later on seeing it on DC Universe or HBO Max, which are now entirely new eras of people discovering Young Justice? Which, you know, like, it's... <sighs> It's a very interesting era to be in now, like now watching people experience Young Justice. I got into Young Justice, oh my goodness, and Emily, you could probably, you probably have a better beat on like what this time frame was, but it was around the time the third season was starting. Okay, so that was DC Universe. Uh, okay. So that was just just a couple years ago. That was just yeah. uh, two, three years ago, something like that. Time runs together. Time is a construct, but... <laughs> We had, um, uh, the, the Quest team actually uh, was going over, they wanted to go over the series when because the third season was coming out. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and so, and then on top of that, you know, we actually all really got into the series because we knew that we were going to be interviewing you guys <laughs> for the Whelmed, uh, for, you know, for your whole show from Whelmed. And it was, um, so we're like, oh, we should probably just binge watch all throughout it. And um, so here, a fun fact on this one, too. So we we unfortunately didn't get to record with you that day, but we did get to record with Rich and Richard. Yes, I think this and, was yeah. when they were kind of doing their little mini podcast tour for the Descent into Midnight Kickstarter that was yes. coming out. So yeah. they were going they were going everywhere and talking about everything uh, yeah. to, to, to be like, we made a cool fish RPG. Uh <laughs> Which is the very, very par- pared down version of how to explain Descent into Midnight, but we've talked about even, it many times on this show. Descent in, into Midnight is an incredible feat of, of RPG playing, and I very yes. much appreciate it. Uh, but a uh, funny story behind all of that as well is, you know, Cole, Alex, and myself were trying to binge through the show as quickly as possible. Uh, and then I had made it halfway through the second season, and Alex and Cole had finished. <laughs> And so on the drive out to them, we were all in the same car. And I was like, I swear, if anybody spoils this for me, I'm just, I'm just going to leave you in this town. Like, that's it. Like, I'm just going to. And and so they're like, okay, we promise we'll figure out ways to like talk around each other and all that stuff. I'm like, okay, cool. Right. First thing that we do in the podcast is just everybody spoiling everything for me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no. And you know, it, it's kind of my fault, right? Because the, the act of binging. Um, and, and I, I also kind of hate using that word, um, yeah, but like the act of, the act of just watching everything, marathoning, thank you. The act of marathoning all at the same time is a very daunting task for me. Uh, I, I can't, 
like all I can do like two, three episodes max, and then I have to be doing something else. <laughs> Because I feel like, like, oh, no, like, with all the things that I'm doing, like, I should definitely hop onto another project or something else like that. And uh, and I want to give it the time that it deserves. Uh, so, yeah, to answer your question, it was it was right around when the third season was starting. Nice. Yes. And what was your history with uh, DC and comics in general b- before that, before watching Young Justice? Uh, I've shared this on a few shows before, uh, but... I learned how to read English through uh, through comic books. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, a little bit of a of a late start with learning English in general. I grew up in a predominantly Hispanic area. My family is from the Philippines, and um, and so I got a mix of Filipino and Spanish, or Tagalog and Spanish, if I want to be you know more. I don't want any Filipino people yelling at me <laughs> through this podcast. Yeah. So Tagalog and and Spanish through this, right? And uh, as we were going to school, it was really tough for me to, to get the grasp of, uh, of reading down. And um, my brothers, you know, bought comic books yeah. and they would read them to me. And my mom figured out like, oh, hey, like, if you read this to me, I'll buy you whatever comics you want. You just have to read it to me. And that's how I learned how to read English. That's amazing. And um, I have a, you know, being a little brother, uh, I very much have a, I have a soft spot in my heart for sidekicks. Right. It's it's something that um, I think is an incredible storytelling tool because it's a I mean, I hate to quote Britney Spears, but it's um, I'm not a girl, but not yet a woman. <laughs> and uh, and I don't so, know what I thought you were going to say, but that was expecting. <laughs> you know, I try, <laughs> that's kind of just my brand. Like, I'm going to try to sound as smart as possible th- doing this and say the dumbest thing I possibly can. <laughs> Uh, and, and yeah, no, I mean, uh, you have to quote the, the wonderful Britney Spears. Yeah. It, it's kind of that, that weird sort of mixture, right? Like you're in that in between. And I, I think that's why, you know, I think that's why both you and I got so into masks in the first place as, as a storytelling tool, uh, for tabletop RPGs. I've run a, a small convention panel talking about kind of the history of teen superhero teams, especially, and why they're so essential to the genre and what they do in the larger superhero genre. And so much of it to me is that I think part of the main appeal of teen superhero teams is the idea that when you are a superhero, the world is constantly ending. And when you are a teenager, the world constantly feels like it's ending. So it allows you to do these big dramatic storylines with the emotional gravity that those would have for people and explore them in very emotional and vulnerable ways that you don't necessarily expect or assume from like adult superheroes because they're supposed to be like we have we have our lives together and we're just going to defeat the bad guy whereas teen superheroes are allowed to be like defeating the bad guy is hard and we're going to talk about it for a minute i also love the idea of of teen superheroes or 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 just teen heroics in general in media Uh, mostly because it is the one it's kind of like the one strip of time in your life that everybody wanted to get to, right? When you're a little kid, you look at teenagers and you and you think, oh my gosh, they are so cool and they have it all together, right? And as an adult, now I look at teenagers and I'm like, oh my god, you're so lucky you don't have to pay bills <laughs> or like or, or or you don't have to deal with insurance or like anything like this, right? And it's it's a very, very desirable uh, uh, time in your life, but then also it's a very incredibly confusing time in your yeah. life too. Yeah. Uh, and, and to, as a, as a child being, being excited for that confusion and as an adult looking back and realizing how ridiculous that confusion was. Yeah. Um, it, it's a, I would say like teen stories are kind of like the world war two of, of just storytelling in general. Right. Everybody kind of relies on it. Everybody kind of loves that particular time frame. Everybody thinks the absolute best of that particular time frame as well. So that's that's kind of how I think about it. Yeah, that's an inter- that's an interesting way of approaching it. Yeah, no, there's just there's something about it. There's a reason YA is its own section in a bookstore that everybody gravitates towards, and we won't go down that rabbit hole again just yet. <laughs> oh yeah, no, because we yeah, c- that will be on our new podcast, <laughs> on our new Shadow and Bone podcast, Emily. We're doing it's just, this. It's just me and JPG talking about <laughs> these books for hours on end. <laughs> no, but uh, speaking 
of all of this. So when we first started discussing uh, what you might want to talk about today here on Whelmed, the topic that came up was a discussion of archetypes in media in general and in the superhero genre specifically. And I just think that is a, a great jumping off point. And I am so excited for this discussion. So let's just dive into all of this. First of all, for our listeners at home who might not know, uh, how would you define what an archetype is for anyone who might not be savvy and familiar with this term? Uh, this this is definitely right up my alley, and I cheated a little bit with picking this as well, because I used to be an English teacher. Huh? Uh, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, I always taught my students that it's kind of like an original pattern and model, right? This is something that is going to be immediately recognizable, right? Um, uh, and, and I bring up the... I, I kind of bring up the idea of cartoonists, right? A good cartoonist will make sure that the character on screen could be seen as a silhouette. And you know exactly who that is at that point, right? Yeah. An archetype is going to be the same exact thing, but through personality and through storytelling and all that stuff. Uh, the archetypes in writing is going to be whatever that silhouette is, that's how we're going to be knowing what type of character to expect. Yes. And of course, a lot of great storytelling is going to be coming out of breaking archetypes or leaning into archetypes as well. And we'll but be getting we have to. <laughs> Uh, yes, and but we have to understand the idea of archetypes as a general concept first in order to play around with that sort of stuff. Yes, definitely. As I like to think of them a lot of the time when talking about this kind of thing is like their shorthand for your audience mm. of being able to kind of like introduce a character and the audience has some idea of who this character is based on the way that they're presented on screen, especially in like uh, visual media of being able to be like, the way this character is designed or introduced or whatever it is, is going to tell you something about what you can expect from that character kind of thing. Like you see mm -hmm. Batman standing on a rain soaked roof in the middle of Gotham with his cape blowing in the wind and a full moon and the cowl and everything. You're like, I have a, a general vibe read on that. I can, I have an idea of where this is going. Your <laughs> home life must have not been great. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, hmm, I, I see where we're going here. Yeah. It's like, I can pull out my fancy theater degree and be like, it all stems back to the Commedia dell'arte and uh, Italian theater troops and everything and bore everyone to death with the fact that I know far too much about that entire concept. Mm, but... but I do have to argue, though, as an as a former English teacher, that theater is what got us to places like the novel, like yeah. film, like television. Right. You know, theater was theater was something that theater was always something that felt ahead of its time, even during its time frame at that point, because it was all these random people who had to act like somebody else and had lines. And then even if you didn't, if you messed up the lines and you just had to do it live and it's like, it's, it's a whole thing. It, it, it doesn't, theater doesn't feel like it should have been created way back in ancient times. Right. It feels like it should have been created 50 years from now. <laughs> Oh, that makes that makes that makes me feel very me and my theater degree feel very special. But oh, trust for, me, I have an English degree, much more useless. <laughs> I have both. Uh, I was a double major. Uh, oh no! But no, I I love my my liberal arts education. Uh, but actually, because we were talking about archetypes, I will go off on my mini tangent about the Commedia dell'arte for a second because I actually find it interesting. I Comedia wanted to hear it. <laughs> okay, well, I'm so glad. Uh, the Commedia dell'arte was this concept of of Italian theater that was a traveling troupe of performers. Uh, that was some some of the very very early early mo quote unquote modern theater, like earlier than Shakespeare, but later than Greek theater kind of thing. That weird space, uh, and they would be a troupe of performers who would travel around and present these plays that had stock characters that each had costumes that were recognizable and kind of the general idea was you'd roll into a town and you'd kind of get the vibe of a town and ask questions of the locals and be like so who's the who's the richest guy in town that can take a joke and who's the who's the couple that everybody knows in town kind of thing and you would gather all that information and then performing the show in these costumes everyone recognized you would kind of slip those names and facts about the town into your performance so people understood oh, this is kind of like an inside joke about things, but also 
I know exactly what that costume that that person is wearing represents. Like, oh, that's the fool character or that's the old that's the old patriarch character. And those are the lovers and the masks and costumes they wore showed that archetype to an audience. And that kind of laid that foundation for creating leading to like modern improv theater and a bunch of other things that came along later that used those kinds of shorthand and archetypes to communicate bigger concepts to an audience more quickly. And that's Emily taking her theater hat off uh, and <laughs> stop talking about a thing most people have never heard of uh, that I learned about in multiple classes and wrote a paper on. Trust me, I'm right there with you right now. Uh, I think my thesis, it was a whole thing about Watchmen and about how they used mirror panels. Nice. Uh, and yeah, oh gosh, yeah, no, I'm... I'm right there. I wrote my my honors thesis was a 75 page paper about uh, the history and influence of Catwoman on comics. So I'm right there with you for writing comic book. Comic I'm gonna book need theses. you to. I'm just gonna need you to send that to me later. Like if you. <laughs> <laughs> I could probably I could probably do that. It's like uh, a weird request, but I, but but I want to put it on air just just so just so when people on twitter can call you out for not sending it to me that's that's where they're gonna help me out yes thank you yes my showing up to the english department and pitching my so i want to write about comics but i don't want to write about like prestige graphic novels that you've probably heard of i want to write about the supervillain who dresses like a cat because she's actually really important and really nuanced and i need you to understand here is my two-page pitch please let me write this and they're like okay i'm like thank you I will see you in a year with a finished paper. Yeah, uh, I just, if I have to hear another paper about Habibi or blankets or something like that, like, no, I like, I like taking the mainstream quote unquote trash that, <laughs> that, that people just automatically think is trash and, and then putting a, an educational spin on it. Yes. No, my honors thesis advisor was wonderful and dealt with me giving her comics to read. And she'd be like, so there's a guy named the penguin who wears a suit and carries an umbrella and his crimes are bird themed. I'm like, yes. And she's like, okay, okay. Well, I will run yeah, with but it. That, um, that's the kind of people who don't read all of the crime in Florida, you know? <laughs> and like, and like, how, like, how is this, how is the penguin more ridiculous than those stories? Right? Like, how? it's, I, I don't know, man. But, I have a lot of I have a lot of feelings. I have a lot of feelings. <laughs> but yes. Comics. They're wonderful and ridiculous, and we write <laughs> genuine criticism about them and should. <laughs> but archetypes. Speaking of ridiculous things in comics, let's talk about superhero archetypes specifically. So there, there are archetypes for larger media, as we were just talking about, Commedia dell'arte. Uh, but there's also these kind of archetypes that have developed within specific subgenres. If you look at like if you look at sci-fi, there are sci-fi sci-fi archetypes. If you look at fantasy, there are fantasy archetypes. And if you look at superheroes, there have developed over time in this weird little mini genre that we have those own archetypes. So like what are some examples that you can think of of archetypes that people would know and recognize from the superhero genre? Well, first before we get into that, I did want to make sure that, you know, I think we heavily rely on archetypes in in um, in superhero media, because superheroes are the American mythology, yes. right? Yeah, uh, we we you know a lot of a lot of writers will point you know to Greek mythology or to um, to like East Asian mythology and like and those are the the ancient things that have been passed on from generation to generation. But you know, America's only been around for less than three hundred years, yeah. and this is our mythology, right? I think, and I think a lot of people don't get to think about it in that way. Now, that being said, uh, with archetypes, um, it makes me absolutely sick that <laughs> the first 10 playbooks that you have in Masks, A New Generation, just nailed every, almost every <laughs> archetype you can think of for teens. It makes me sick that somebody that was a straight up genius was just like, oh yeah, and like this person is going to be this, and this is that, and then these two overlap, but then this can be its own book. It makes me so mad. Like looking at that because it's just thing, so like, clean. Oh. It's so perfect. It's like, oh, you got it in the first the first time. Uh -huh. like what? What like genius billionaire? 
<laughs> like just just like oh hey here's like the first 10 playbooks that you can think of right and 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 that's why i think i love uh, i was so excited to talk to you personally about this right because you're obsessed with two very very like deep things that i'm obsessed with which <laughs> is this show and masks at the same time <laughs> I love both. They're connected in many ways. Uh. So many ways, yes. But I mean, okay, so to give you a fair answer, right? I, I mean, like, you you have to first and foremost have um, some sort of leadership type, right? Because if you're going to have more than two people on screen, they're all going to need to be directed in a way that is entertaining to the audience itself, right? No. Um, they do they do this here with, with Calderon. And which is Aqualad in the show. And uh, we very much have him start as being a reluctant leader. Yeah. Uh, but also, like, I think the leadership archetypes are the ones that have always appealed to me the most. Yeah. Why? Um, you know, you... Oh, gosh. I'm curious. Uh, <laughs> you can't well, say something am... like that on a podcast and not expect the host to go, can you tell me more? I am... I'm much, much, much older than you, Emily, which we found out outside of this show, um, because I'm about, I'm about like 780 years old. Uh, I am a Highlander. Yeah. So. And I'm only 204. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. There's, you gotta, you have a lot of catching up to do. So, so uh, one of the very first shows that made a very large impact on me, um, was Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, uh, that came out in the early nineties. Uh, and, um, the Red Ranger, his name was Jason, which is what the J stands for in JPG. And I can't tell you how much of my life and personality has been dictated by the fact that that dude had the same name as me. <laughs> because I look back and, you know, like, uh, and, and, you know, like when you're like, oh, like I'm becoming my, I'm becoming one of my parents because I just said this out loud. Sure. Right. It's the same sort of feeling when you're very young and somebody has somebody is cool on TV and they have the same exact name as you. <laughs> like I'm having like flashbacks to like uh, middle grade fantasy novels where I'm reading where I'm like, yeah, no, yeah, I really I loved that character because she was named Emily. That was a thing that I did. Yep. Yep. I'm telling you, right. I got to OK. I got to ask because you put me on the spot now too. Oh, no. which Emily was your favorite Emily. Oh, this is so I'm thinking too hard about it and not like the fact that there is one that immediately comes to mind means that's probably the one I should say. There was a oh, yeah, <laughs> even though it's like, eh, I don't know if this is true. I just can't think of any other Emily's, which means this is probably true. There was a series of uh, children's slash middle grade novels called Avalon Web of Magic that were about three girls who found like some magic rocks and became like the protectors of a fantasy world that was there's, there's a forest and there's some talking animals and it's a lot like I don't remember all the lore and I never technically finished the series even though I have six of the books still on my shelf down there somewhere in the background of this video um so they're locked right now but <laughs> I was like, I will pull out this book and prove this. But uh, one of the main characters in that was named Emily and she had brown hair and she I was like, oh, I wonderful here. I shall I shall fall in love with this series and it shall be mine, even though like if I went back and looked at it, probably I don't I don't know if she'd still be like, oh, that's the one I relate to. But her name was Emily. So, of course, she was the one I related to. Do you happen to remember any sort of like uh, personality uh, traits that she had or like anything like that? So this was a was was a middle grade uh, girls magic series, which meant there were three girls and they each had to have distinct aesthetics and distinct personalities because this is how you sell middle grade fiction in the age when I was a child. And so there was Emily who was there was OK. There was Kara, who was the pretty uh, popular blonde one. Uh, who wore okay. a lot of pink because this is, if we're talking about archetypes, gestures vaguely. <laughs> there was Adrian, who was like a baby goth, uh, essentially. Baby goth uh, slash forest girl who had a wolf companion because that is several layers of that kind of nonsense. And it's wonderful. And there was Emily, who was like, my brain is saying, 
the normal one. Like she was <laughs> new in town and she was kind of quiet, but she liked animals and she was trying her best. Uh, like literally it was like pink, black, the other one. Uh, <laughs> like if you lined them up on a cover, but she was named Emily and she had brown hair and she seemed cool and she had a talking ferret who was her friend. And I was like, Yep, that we will we shall latch on to this media as a child. And the fact that I still remember any of the details from these books when I read them in fourth and fifth grade, which was a long time ago at this point, means that <laughs> these are important. Architects. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I've never think... talked about this on air. <laughs> <laughs> And you, I think this is the, I, I guess like this is why I wanted to talk about the importance of archetypes, right? Yes. It dictates a lot of the things um, that we experience in the world. And uh, fortunately, it kind of dictates a lot about our personalities, right? Um, I'll take the archetype right now of uh, of Superboy, right? Sure. Uh, Connor is in a hot, angry mess. And I mean hot in the sense of, like, he he just, he was very angry constantly all the time. And then also very weird to make him that hot just straight out of that that birthing tube at that point. Uh, it's but, it's you know, what the teen audience deserves. <laughs> it's what we deserved. <laughs> but we, we have this person overcome anger throughout a few seasons and then, uh, like, be like the everybody surrogate dad by the third season. And, and like, if that isn't a glow up in itself, right? Like, we have talked about this so much on the show because I, de- I deeply love Connor. I, <laughs> to all of the reasons, but Connor's progression, especially into season three, that we have talked about a lot is the idea. Connor in season three is a mechanic and talks about how he enjoys fixing things and helping people and all of this stuff. And I, like, almost cried when it sunk in, I think, that Connor's arc over the three seasons of the show so far has been from a teenage boy who was built for and thought he was only good for destruction and destroying things who grows up into a man who finds purpose in fixing broken things and i think that that is well just wonderful connor's wonderful i love connor's arc uh (laughs) it's something that i've always like connected to uh especially in dc is the idea of robin Yes. Right. Yes. Robin, for some reason, and I'll speak specifically about the Dick Grayson Robin because I was when I was growing up, Tim Drake was Robin. Yeah. Uh, and then um, I didn't know too much about Jason Todd because the guys at the comic book shop, knowing that my name is Jason, very much shielded me from a lot of the uh, a lot of the there's a lot of problematic, not problematic storytelling, but a lot of um, uh, storytelling that really that really wasn't fair. To Jason Todd and the guys at the shop definitely protected me from that. Uh, but seeing Dick Grayson, right? Um, and I, I wish I had some of my artwork around here too. But um, I actually, uh, anytime I get like artwork from big artists, it's always going to be Nightwing, right? Yeah. Robin, for some reason, is deemed to be good enough to to be alongside the smartest, most hardworking, most singularly focused person in all of DC Comics. Right. Which is Batman. And then you get to see like through this particular archetype. And, you know, of course, I'm going to use the masks archetypes just to make it a little bit easier for the audience. Um, You can actually download these on the website as well for Magpie Games. Yes. All of the playbooks are available and easy to get. And it's wonderful because it means you can easily play masks with anyone. Exactly. Uh, But look at the protege archetype. Right. Uh, And with that, right. Robin is the kind of archetype where it is, I've been told all of my life that this is what I have to do. And then getting to the point where you have to make a choice as to do you want to follow that or do you not? And Dick Grayson traditionally makes a choice that he does not want to follow the path that Batman had. Because ultimately he figures out that this isn't, this is thankless. This is, uh, there is no joy in this, right? There is only the mission as opposed to, with Dick Grayson, there was still joy in him when his parents were killed in a very similar way. Uh, so getting to see the archetype make those types of choices. I would also say also look at the legacy as well. The legacy has a little bit of that also. For anyone unfamiliar with what we're talking about, even though we talk about it a lot here on Whelmed, but if this is your first episode and you've somehow never heard us talk about it, 
JPG is referencing a wonderful tabletop RPG called Masks, A New Generation, which is a game about telling stories of young heroes being heroes and being teenagers and figuring out who they are and who they want to be. And it is a story, it is a game largely focused around exploring themes of identity and who you are in the world. So the two playbooks that uh, JPG just referenced are The Protégé, which is often described as the Robin playbook. That is the idea of playing a young teen sidekick who is part of, who's been trained over and over again to be something, whatever it may be. And The Legacy, which is the idea of kind of a Kid Flash style character who is one in a long line of superheroes. So it's like sidekick and like third generation sidekick. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, this kind of leads me to like a question that I had for you. Yes, what? Um, okay, so I know that you've created characters for for masks for different shows and all that stuff. I know about Highwire. Yes. Um, what other uh, what other characters have you created as well? Uh, so I have played. I'm trying to think. I've played Highwire, who is a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful reformed, trying her best to not be a villain anymore, uh, and is all of my circus nonsense distilled into one character. I've played an outsider uh, who was from a planet whose name I don't remember anymore because I played her so long ago, but she was kind of a wonderful mashup of Miss Martian, Starfire, and a character from Marvel known simply as Singularity who is wonderful and trying her best. So many of my mass characters are just uh, lovely teen girls trying their best. Played a delinquent. I think those are my main three, and someone's going to tell me I'm forgetting someone I played once, but those are my main three that I have played in action. I have so many other ideas for characters I have yet to find a show to play on yet, but yeah, those are my main my main three that I have played are... Oh, I also... Wow, I can't believe I'm forgetting this. I played Miss Martian one time. I played Miss Martian here on Whelmed. <laughs> that was the first time I ever played Mask. I played uh, Miss Martian as the uh, Nova playbook. Uh, oh. So, yeah. Yes, because we here on Whelmed, for anyone who's forgotten that we did this one time many years ago, uh, when I first joined the team, we did a actual play mini one shot. It was a one shot that we released in a couple of episodes that the name of what we called it is escaping my brain right now. But uh, we played this with uh, Brendan Conway, the creator of Mask, who GM'd for us. And we played a uh, kind of fan fiction kind of style story set between seasons one and two. So we, instead of giving me Miss Martian as the outsider playbook, which is what she is generally listed as in the actual uh, Masks rule book of like, if you want to play Miss Martian, play the outsider who is a character from another world who is trying to fit in. Instead, we uh, cast her as the Nova, which is a playbook based around the idea of a young character who has exceptional powers they don't know how to control. So we were leaning into the idea that comes in in season one and is explored more heavily in season two that Miss Martian is super duper powerful and struggles to figure out how to deal with that. So yeah, that was, and that's the other thing about archetypes and about masks that I think is wonderful is that so many characters are multiple archetypes depending on how you want to approach them in any given story that you tell. And even the guidelines in masks that give you really wonderful like if you want to play Artemis you play her as this kind of thing there are a million other angles you can still approach that character from so like Miss Martian is the outsider but depending on where you are in her timeline she is also the Nova she is also other things and I love that so yeah I play I play masks <laughs> I think that was your original question was like <laughs> well, what no, I just want to know what characters, right? Uh, okay, so when it came to to creating those characters, though, yes. right? Like we are, we're constantly pulling inspiration from, uh, you know, from from what we're seeing in everyday life, right? We talked a little bit about like you know getting inspiration from our namesakes at this point too. Yes. But what's an archetype to you that was that that you look at and you're just like oh my God, that's me. That's what I want to be. That's what I always have been, right? Like, so so that's what, that's where I was trying to get to, right? Because I play a lot of masks also, right? I play, um, you mentioned this at the beginning of the show, but I play the Steel Spectre uh, for Nerds on a Roll, which you were Blue Spider for. Thank you so much for that. Yes, I in their wonderful audio drama episode, I got to play someone's superhero mentor. <laughs> 
I uh, I also get to play the Blade of Sorrows and uh, on very Moon sad Harbor boy. Heroes. Yeah, v- uh, like very sad flirty boy. Uh, <laughs> now, yeah, uh, and then that's what masks um, is for. No, that's kind of what masks is for. Yeah, you have a lot of feelings, but also you have a lot of um, chem chemicals chemistry. Like okay, genuinely, I will say that when we had Brendan Conway on, we all, uh, Rich, my wonderful co-host, uh, did a discussion session with Brendan Conway, creator of Masks, about this, and asked him what was uh, your inspiration for this and when he brought up the story that part of it was he saw a comic book cover in a comic store that was the character of x23 uh who oh, is God. the so follow me here x23 who is the uh cloned quote-unquote daughter of wolverine who mm-hmm. is a teen girl full of rage and also knives uh yeah. and the version of cyclops that had time traveled to our time period at this point in where comics were kissing on the cover of a comic book and went, I want to make a game that lets me do whatever nonsense that is kind of thing. (laughs) Where it's like, this is the cloned daughter of one of the most famous Marvel Comics heroes and a time traveling alternate dimension version of another one of Marvel's most famous superheroes and they're dating. What is that game? (laughs) Kind of thing. And then going from there. I need that. And I think that is... That to me is often when I'm trying to explain to people, it's like, well, what is the teen superhero genre? I'm like, it's it's this vibe. It's this, yeah. it's this energy of like the world is ending. We're punching giant robots in space, but also you need to figure out who you're going to the prom with. And that's masks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. no, that's that's perfect. Yeah. And, and I think with the complexities of what you're talking about, right, that's why we heavily heavily rely upon archetypes in order to try to tell the types of stories that we want to. Yes. Right? So that Um, things don't get lost. (laughs) Conclude part one. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening and stay whelmed.